Hello, I'm Douglas Kent, Technical and Research Director at the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, or SBAB for short, the UK's oldest pressure group campaigning to save old buildings from harm. I've been asked to give a short talk today on old buildings and energy efficiency. Old buildings are one of our greatest national assets. To the designer William Morris and the other early luminaries of the SBAB, old buildings have an impact on the human psyche and can uplift our spirits. This image, not far from where I am now, in North West Essex, makes me proud to be British. The wonderful half-timbered 15th century Guildhall, with its small museum, has the fine medieval church as a backdrop and is juxtaposed with Georgian architecture in the centre of this historic market town. Yet, despite the value we place on our historic environment in the UK, Many old buildings, including a great number of older museums, are at risk of becoming a liability by virtue of being seen by some as having poor energy efficiency, therefore hobbling the nation's progress towards meeting its carbon targets. Global climate change and the conservation of non-renewable resources are widely held to be among the most pressing challenges facing humanity. I took this picture following flooding just a few weeks ago near home. As I hope to explain in this talk, old buildings are frequently not the energy efficiency disaster that they are often perceived to be, and their conservation can help not hinder our advance towards a circular economy with its emphasis on reducing waste, reuse and recycling. The purpose of my short talk today is to offer some practical options for thermally upgrading older buildings to improve their energy efficiency while at the same time protecting their special interest. My emphasis will be on museums, but many of the points I make are applicable to older buildings more generally. My local museum in Saffron Walden in Essex is shown here, dating from 1835. It's one of the country's oldest purpose-built museums. The talk falls into several parts, the main ones relating to principles and priorities associated with improving the energy efficiency of older buildings. First, some introductory comments. Assessing the true energy use of buildings involves looking at not just their heating costs, but also the resources they consume throughout their whole lives. This includes the energy use in the manufacture, in other words, the embodied energy, as well as disposal of their components. Old, in other words, pre circa 1919 buildings are often constructed from materials with lower embodied energy than new ones, such as wattle and daub, comprising sticks or lath, and earth, straw, and possibly animal dung, as shown here. Components in older buildings frequently also have longer lifespans and are easier to repair than their modern counterparts, as with windows. And additionally, older buildings not uncommonly possess features conducive to minimising operational energy use, such as thatched roofs, thick walls able to retain heat and release it gradually, and windows arranged to maximise daylight but minimise heat loss. The building seen here is a former Marshman's house at Howhill Nature Reserve in Norfolk, which is now the Toad Hole Cottage Museum. Old buildings are also not as inefficient as often claimed, according to a 10-year research project recently undertaken by the SBOB. We found that in 77% of cases, the thermal performance of solid walls measured in situ was better than calculation suggested, sometimes by a factor of up to three. Many old buildings adapt well to modern living requirements, as with this 15th century townhouse at Thetford and Norfolk, which is now the Ancient House Museum. It was purchased in the 1920s by an SBAB member and volunteer, Prince Julie Singh, and presented to the town for use as a museum. I took this photo before the work took place to install an access ramp at the front. Furthermore, old buildings are constructed of lime mortar and other materials that can be easily recycled. Conserving rather than replacing old buildings can therefore be inherently sustainable. It could be argued that this figure, William Morris, the founder in 1877 of the SBB, was one of the first to promote, albeit indirectly, the concept of sustainability. 
Nevertheless, those living in old buildings can frequently still do more to save energy. Improvements can usually be made, providing care is taken to avoid unintentional damage. Let's look now at the principles that the SBAB suggests are adopted when setting out to thermally upgrade an old building. The fundamental advice for anyone who cares for an old building is always to maintain it well and, where required, carefully repair or upgrade its components using appropriate materials and techniques, rather than replacing them. Misguided work may not only be unnecessary and compromise the special interest of an old building, but saves little, if any, energy. SPAB founder William Morris talked of the need to stave off decay by daily care, prop a perilous wall, or mend a leaky roof. For some years, the Society has run a National Maintenance Day to highlight the need for good upkeep and involved well-known personalities such as Linda Barker shown here. Instead of adopting a crude blanket approach such as replacing all old windows with double glazed units, consider better informed targeted measures that accurately identify essential work. For example, air tightness tests by a suitable specialist, as photographed here, can establish where heat really is escaping from a building and thereby pinpoint the areas that would benefit most from draft proofing. Thermal imaging can be used either with or without air tightness tests to identify areas of heat loss. Even if they are identified as a source of heat leakage, the replacement of old single glazed windows that perhaps only need a little repair with new double glazing that has a short 30 year life or less in many cases, is illogical. The embodied energy and lifespan of the new units negates the energy saving made while they're in service. These highly inappropriate plastic double glazed windows were installed by Stansted Airport in this Grade 2 listed building without listed building consent. They were subsequently removed after the SBAB contacted the District Council. We also issued a media release comparing the mistreatment of an old building in this way as like dressing your great granny in hot pants. With all work to an old building, use compatible methods and materials, not just standard solutions that may work for more modern buildings. Most pre-circa 1919 buildings, including those that are unlisted, need to breathe. They're usually built of permeable porous materials, which are frequently lime or earth-based. Old buildings permit moisture to be absorbed by the fabric, but evaporate back out. Modern buildings, on the other hand, depend upon cavities, barriers and membranes to keep water out. They are analogous to a raincoat, whereas an old building is more like an overcoat. Well-intended but ill-advised energy efficiency measures, such as covering walls with impermeable materials or restricting ventilation too much, may cause condensation, promote rot and aggravate human health problems, including asthma, by turning a cold damp building into a warm damp bomb. Old buildings shouldn't be used for experimentation. Colourless water repellent solutions are heavily marketed and commonly promoted as being highly breathable, but should normally be avoided on old buildings. There are concerns about their long-term effects on historic walls. I'm now going to move on from principles to priorities when it comes to addressing the energy efficiency of old buildings. It makes sense to adopt a step-by-step -step approach when contemplating improvements to the energy efficiency of an old building. Consider first basic maintenance, then any quick wins, and finally big hits. There's little sense, of course, in attempting to improve insulation levels in a building if the walls are damp or drafts have not been properly addressed. Many people focus on expensive high-tech solutions when thinking about making their homes greener, but it's best to start with practical routine maintenance. Straightforward measures such as regularly clearing out or overhauling gutters will stave off the decay and unnecessary replacement of building components. They'll also prevent your walls becoming wetter and therefore less thermally efficient, as for the use of breathable finishes such as lime wash rather than moisture trapping plastic based paints containing petrochemicals. A damp wall can be 30% less efficient thermally than a dry one. Keeping windows and doors in good repair will reduce heat loss too, while rewashering dripping taps cuts down on water wasted 
and repointing or filling receded mortar joints and walls will also be beneficial. After addressing maintenance, concentrate next on quick wins, measures that can be implemented easily, have a short payback and cause little disturbance to the fabric from the old building. Draft proof your floorboards, windows and doors, noting that covers can be provided for letter boxes and keyholes. Inflatable chimney balloons, chimney umbrellas, wool draft excluders or just scrunched up newspaper may be used to stop heat loss from flues not in use, or if present, dampers can be closed. Longer term solutions can involve blocking the fireplace at the bottom, but it's important to fit a cap at the top to stop rainwater entering and also to allow vents at the top and bottom to minimise the risk of condensation forming within the flue. Add heavy curtains, insulated blinds and at the bottoms of doors, fabric sausages. Add or reinstate shutters. Here are some examples from the SBB's Georgian headquarters in London Spitalfields. Consider secondary glazing, as also seen here in our SBB offices. Secondary glazing comprises panes that go inside your existing windows and may be designed to allow removal if not wanted in the summer. It can outperform standard double glazing and is also better for noise insulation. Next, ensure loft spaces are well insulated, including pipework and the access hatch. Other quick wins could involve lagging your hot water cylinder, fitting thermostatic radiator valves and low energy light fittings installing a water butt for garden purposes and placing water saving devices in laboratory systems. More significant work that could be justified might entail upgrading your boiler and heating system, maybe changing to a renewable fuel source. Also insulating below floors or in certain circumstances, reinstating a missing lime render or rain screen such as vertical tiling or weatherboarding on a wall suffering from rainwater penetration. It may be appropriate to reinstate missing internal plaster. Consideration might also be given to increasing wall insulation, but great care should be taken to avoid unintended consequences. Above all, those associated with dampness, especially if insulating walls externally. A recently completed decade long research project by the SBB has shown that over insulation using thick impermeable material may cool a wall enough to cause condensation and the accumulation of moisture. On the other hand, heat loss can be reduced significantly without creating a damp wall using more modest amounts of breathable insulation. The thermal performance of walls in timber frame buildings might be upgraded with a material such as hemp, where there are modern infill panels as opposed to original ones of bottle and door. Bear in mind that a porch or vestibule, etc., appropriately designed, may also be a solution against excessive heat loss through regularly used doors. This image shows a well-designed small extension to the rear of 15th century Finchingfield Guildhall in Essex, a building that houses a state-of-the-art museum, amongst other things. There are a few further points that we should consider. Make sure any advice you follow comes from someone with appropriate knowledge and values. Unfortunately, some of the recommendations on energy performance certificates, EPCs, may be highly inappropriate because the software inadvertently discriminates against older pre circa 1919 buildings. The SBRB may be able to advise on the names of suitable specialists in your area over its technical advice line, details of which will be given at the end of this presentation. Be mindful also that an exemption may be available where undertaking energy efficiency measures that would adversely impact on the significance of a listed building or be refused listed building consent. If you're carrying out major energy efficiency work that triggers the need for building regulation compliance, it's worth remembering that part L of the regulations allows for exemptions and special considerations for traditional buildings, not just listed buildings, so that building control officers can take a sensible view to conserve the character of such buildings, as well as to avoid the introduction of technical risks. Sustainable living is about an entire attitude of mind. We must therefore take a holistic view that considers each building as a whole 
and how the way it's used can be improved. Throw on a thick jumper instead of turning up the heating. Keep your space heating at reasonably even temperatures and of course turn off electrical appliances and lights. Where available, obtain materials locally to limit transport distances and cut pollution. In the end, human activities, not buildings, consume energy. We also need to think about more than buildings if we're to be truly sustainable, including unintended consequences. According to the Gazoom Brooks postulate, improved energy efficiency in buildings has been shown paradoxically to lead to greater individual energy use. The money saved can be used on an activity that consumes even more energy, such as flying abroad more frequently for holidays. My first picture today was of Thaxted in Essex, and my final photograph is also of Thaxted, showing the church being overflown by an aircraft. It seems crazy to me that the right that just right now a planning inquiry is taking place to consider yet another expansion of nearby Stansted Airport, when we should instead be seeking to reduce flights. Both climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic are linked to our disrespect for the natural world. Old buildings can enhance our quality of life and reconnect us with nature, given that they are often built of materials with low embodied energy, frequently sourced locally and reflect their surroundings. The conservation of cultural heritage is recognised by UNESCO as one of the four principal pillars of sustainability. During the pandemic, there has been a growing realisation that we need to fundamentally change the ways in which we live. Far from being carbon villains, as once claimed, old buildings and the values associated with them can play an important part in helping us address one of the most pressing issues of our time. I'd like to end with these words from SBB founder William Morris, which are as relevant today as they were when he delivered them at our AGM in 1889. These old buildings do not belong to us. They have belonged to our forefathers and they will belong to our descendants unless we play them false. They are not in any sense our property to do with as we like. We are only trustees for those that come after us. Thank you for listening. More can be found on the SBB website, including a short document titled Energy Efficiency and Old Buildings, Principles and Priorities, which gives various sources of further information. The website also has details of how you can become a member of the SBB to support our calls, and you can obtain free technical advice over our helpline on 020-7456-0916, which is generously supported by Historic England and operates most weekday mornings between 9.30am and 12.30pm.